All right, the record will reflect the presence of counsel, the defendant, and the jury. So I apologize. We had you wait a little bit longer, but we, that we've reconfigured where you're sitting um, because I think this is going to be uh, easier for you to, to view um, any witness that's on the witness stand. So thank you for your patience. Mr. Um, Griffin, if you'd like to make your opening statement, you may do so. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's nice to talk to you. Um, I have remarks for you. Uh, the one thing I want to relate to you at the very uh, inception of, of my remarks this morning is that in the reasonable doubt instruction, there's, there's language that talks about um, things that we know with absolute certainty. And what we can say to you with absolute certainty is that the death of Sasha Krause is tragic. That's absolutely certain. And that's never forgotten here. The only thing worse the only thing worse than not finding and bringing to justice Sasha Cross's killer would be to accuse and convict the wrong person. That'd be called a miscarriage, miscarriage of justice. And we have many rules and things that we have done to try to make sure, to make sure that there is no miscarriage of justice in this case or any case. One of the ways that we can do that is by applying the rules that we utilize in the process. And those rules are uh, read to you, and we've introduced them to you as we've gone through this process. And they're in that one page at the tail end of the preliminary instructions that you got. And you're, I think you're getting the knack now, the hang of the language we use about the presumption of innocence, the burden of proof, and, and the level that, that's required of beyond a reasonable doubt. I'm not going to go back and go over all those, but it was interesting that in one of the uh, exchanges we had with a juror during the selection process and somebody said, well, why is that? I mean, well, how did we get there? What are the reasons for those rules? And they're so instrumental to our process. I just want to take a moment to say, remember how our country came into being. It came during a period of time that there was unfairness in representation. It came in a period of time when there was unfairness in taxation. And it came in a period of time when there was unfairness, uh, if you will, about justice. How we use those. So we grew as a country and we implemented rules to try to correct all of that and make sure that that injustice, that miscarriage doesn't happen. So that's where all those rules come from. And, um, and they're historic and they have been tweaked and modified over time to make sure that they stay up with the pace of society. But the fundamental principles of trying to make sure that we ensure justice and get a fair trial and don't have a miscarriage is why we, we take all the time that we do uh, so carefully. Um, why have jurors, instead of uh, a judge, make a decision regarding uh, guilt or innocence? It's because jurors are citizens. Citizens are people. People are the government. That's who we are. That's what we do. And so we entrust that if we're going to make an important decision about somebody and accuse them of a crime, while the government can make the accusation, the people make the decision. And we, they make it through the rules and through the system that we use. And we use jurors that are qualified to do that process. Good morning. You're qualified. It's taken a while. And you see why we're so careful. When we're going through this process, um, the voir dire, the selection process, is very instrumental. Um, and so when we talk about those three rules that we've outlined, uh, I hope that you will keep them in your uh, very well remembered as we go through the process and keep them uh, strong and adhere to them carefully and zealously because they're very important. The judge gave you, uh, in, in just sort of in a roundabout way, the litmus test that we're really looking for as we work through the trial. And that litmus test is um, think what you would want if you were the accused. That's, a, that's an easy rule of thumb to remind yourself of the rules, the history, and how we are where we are. So much about, enough about procedure, um, it's important, and it's important to make sure that we then get a fair trial. I want to talk a little bit about the, the evidence that has been outlined to you um, and will be outlined to you further. Um, and I'm not here to argue the case at this point, but it might seem that the state dwelled on certain things and didn't on others and maybe didn't, didn't mention anything that might be important from our perspective. I first want to talk about character. We loosely sometimes say that character matters. So I want to talk to you a little bit about 
about Mark Gooch and his character and what evidence will be presented. And the evidence that will be presented is that he is a peaceful, nonviolent person, which is in direct contradiction to the case that's been outlined before you the prosecutor. Peaceful and nonviolent. Um, in terms of talking about Mark Gooch, the person, Mark Tito. Mark's uh, 22. He was 20 at the time that uh, he was accused of this, initially accused of this, this situation. Mark comes from a family, his parents, Jim and Anita, uh, raised seven children. Mark's the youngest. Mark's the youngest. Uh, they were raised um, in an area, a remote area, kind of a not uh, metropolitan area, in a, an area called Gleason, Wisconsin. Um, they, they were members, the parents, mom and dad were parents, uh, the parents were members of the Mennonite church there. Um, all Mennonite faith is grounded in certain kind of core principles, but they're all a little bit different too. But having said that, uh, Mark was raised in the Mennonite faith. Mark went to church on Sundays in the Mennonite faith, as did all of his family. He went to a Mennonite school, as was the custom and tradition. Uh, so he was raised in all of that faith. Um, so at the time he became of age, Mark decided to go a different direction and not stay there, not stay at the farm, not stay in that community. He decided to go into the United States Air Force. An honorable thing, a good thing. But Mark Gooch didn't go there because he's a violent guy who wants war and, and, and wants to go conquer. It's not Mark Gooch. Mark went there because Mark has... Um, aptitude for and interest in mechanical things, mechanics. And he went into the Air Force because Mark wants to be a jet pilot, jet airplane engine mechanic. That's his thing. And you can all see where, would, where better to get that experience than in the Air Force working on jets. So Mark, Mark took, that, uh, took that step, and at the time that he was charged in this case, he was a member of, still is a member of the U.S. Army. So that's, that's how and where he is and where he's from. Uh, he is single. He has no kids. Uh, he has that uh, Mennonite education that I referred to. So that's a little bit more detail about Mark Gooch. The evidence will tell you about Mark, uh, his person, and his character. Uh, as the state said, Mark Gooch made a statement to law enforcement. Now, Mark Gooch, when he did that, that came after there had been months of investigation and law enforcement had taken statement after statement after statement and done all kinds of investigation on all kinds of different people about who they had to be said. And when they talked to Mark Gooch, they went down to Luke Air Force Base down in Glendale. Some of you know where it is. They went down to Glendale and uh, brought Mark in and, uh, in cooperation with the, the county sheriff's department and the people who run law enforcement on the Air Force Base. And they brought him in under the, under the premise that he needed to take a random urine test. And then they, and then they started questioning him. Um, so when they questioned him, uh, Mark, Mark didn't clam up. Mark did not talk. Mark cooperated in the investigation and cooperated in giving a statement. Uh, not just cooperated, he's polite, he's attentive, He's forthcoming. None of the things that he, he didn't have to do any of those things, but he did. And he did those things. Uh, and what you'll find from the interview, and you're going to hear the interview in its entirety. What you find, what you find from that interview is what I guess I call a yes man, no man thing. He is polite to a fault, as you sometimes find with, with military people. And uh, so we go through that. And during that interview, in just a little bit more detail, you're going to hear about his background, which I've just outlined for you, but he tells them that. And he, and he makes that, uh, that link that, the, that, the, that is so important to the state that he has some Mennonite background. Um, and he explains how he went to the Air Force. Um, and he explained that um, uh, even though he had left the, the church and to pursue the Air Force, this is some of the fellowship that he had in the Mennonite culture. And he was still looking to try to find a Mennonite place in the local area in Arizona that might be able to fit some of his needs uh, in that respect. And so 
so he told them about how he was looking for Mennonite area uh, churches and other things in his area. Well, that's important because when they when they talked to him about travel, um, and they asked him whether he'd gone anywhere, Mark ultimately tells them about, well, yeah, I, I, I first on on that they asked him about whether he'd been out of town on, or anywhere on January. understand Mark had no idea that they were coming. So they pieced together that he traveled up to northern Arizona on that day. Have to tell me that he tells them all that. And he, and he talks about how he didn't go up there for, for some bad reason. He went up there because he was thinking about going to the the bowl. Well, unfortunately, at that time, uh, in mid-January, um, Snow Bowl was closed because of COVID. So he gets up here. And along the way, he's like any other tourist seeing the sights. Even though he's not a tourist, he's just learning about all the cool things that we have in the So he's taking pictures of the road on the way up, uh, of the vehicle that's disabled, and he's a picture of the peaks, that iconic picture in Pino La Paul, coming in from, from, you know, from Lens Park and up by Kachina, and you get a dramatic view of the snow capped peaks, but he takes a picture of that. Uh, so he's not trying to hide anything, he's not trying to. To, to, to not record his journey, uh, he's using his nav situation on his phone, um, and he's progressing up to, the state, up to the northern part of the state. He gets here, finds out that the snowball is closed, and he tells them all that. And then he says, I decided that since I had come up this far, um, and I was aware that there was a Mennonite group in Farmington, I decided to go to the Mennonite group to see if, well, what was going on there. And so he travels that additional distance, and he tells them, Again, it's the evidence that goes through. It's important to go to Dion Foles. He tells him, yeah, I, I, use, I use my car. And again, a car, leaving a record, uses his credit card, to buy, uh, to buy lunch at McDonald's. And so he's leaving the breadcrumbs, the statements, because they're so powerful evidence. He leaves uh, that track. He goes on to farm, stops and gets gas. I think it's at the speedway there. Uses his card again, leaving the record, leaving the problem of where he's going. And then he tells him, and then I went to the church, and I went over to that area, and I looked around, and I ultimately determined I could see that there wasn't going to be any Saturday service. Well, it's not common that a Saturday service occurs, but there are certain revival type meetings and things that happen on the weekends. He said, Mark thought that there might be a chance. So he went over, looked at that, concluded that there was, and he ultimately left. He tells them that when he drove home, he didn't do anything out of the ordinary, anything dramatic, do anything different, except that he may have pulled off and gone to sleep for a couple of hours, and then ultimately went back to Luke. Luke confirms the check-in, Luke confirms the check-out, the surveillance footage. Everybody knows that's there. There's nothing to be hidden from, from all that process. So it's important that you know all about that. So in addition to voluntarily providing all of that, he then, um, I, I, let me just shift. I want to talk about, in addition to that information, um, what's, um, uh, I, just, I think I've skipped over something I wanted to say. Just one moment. No, I think that's, that covers all the areas. So I want, to, I want to talk about, in addition to what Mark voluntarily provides, and I mentioned this a little bit in some of the board diary that I conducted with some of the groups. But um, I want to talk about evidence that's important that might not be available to you or might not have been generated that's crucial in a case like this. And what you're going to find from the evidence is just a forewarning, is something that the state talked about as well. They went over it pretty quickly. They said, there won't be any eyewitnesses. That's true. There's not an eyewitness to anything in this case. So what are we talking about? Well, no one saw Mark Gooch at the church area. No one. No one saw Mark Gooch at or near Sasha Krause's car. No one saw Mark Gooch in, in the church building. No one saw Mark Gooch leave the area. Nobody saw Mark Gooch's car at any time. So all of that's important. Um, at the, at the scene of, of, the, of the church area where the disappearance occurred, there's not a sign that Mark Gooch was ever there. 
no tire tracks, talked about that nobody saw his car. There is not a fingerprint on the door. There's not a hair or a fiber found. Uh, they dusted the, the, the money box that you'll hear about. They, they looked for all types of trace evidence. There's no evidence of Mark Gooch being involved in any of that in, in the church or in the area whatsoever. Um, there are no evidence, they, as you can appreciate, there was a careful examination of Sasha's car. Sasha's car was parked right by the, the church area where she was And there's no evidence that Mark Gooch had anything to do with her car. Again, all the types of CSI that we're sort of making fun of, that kind of stuff, but are rooted in investigatory tactics are not there. There's no fingerprint evidence found, no fiber, no hair, no DNA, no nothing that's associated with Sasha Krause's car. Um, so they looked at communications to try to determine if there was any communication or connection. So here's the bottom line. Uh, they looked uh, high and low through all of Sasha Krause's material. And she had lots of journals and had lots of writings and had all of this types of communications. Not one indication that she had ever any knowledge of or had any familiarity with Mark Beach. And in fact, as all the evidence you'll hear from the people in the Mennonite community, no one ever heard of Mark Beach. And so uh, we have all of that information. Um, there is no indication uh, whatsoever that Mark Gooch and Sasha Krauss ever knew each other whatsoever. None, none, no indication of that at all. And that raises the question um, that was used in some of the voir dire, some of the selection process, about motive and, how, and whether motive is an important consideration. And the bottom line is that the state has really no motive whatsoever to try to suggest that a peaceful, nonviolent person who didn't know this individual would have had any reason whatsoever to abduct, let alone harm. And they tell you about evidence that they have that is twofold. One is a text message between Mark and his brother where he talks about looking at some people at a church. And the context is what the state is trying to suggest supports their position, but we'll carefully analyze that, and I think you can come to a different conclusion. The second piece of information that the state is trying to quantum leap into a, an argument that there was motive here to harm Sasha Krause is, a, 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 again, a text message where the brothers, several of Mark's brothers and he, had a discussion about a Mennonite who received a ticket, and they made fun of it. That's what they have. They have nothing that would suggest a motive to kill or an animus or a hatred or any of those kinds of things. They just don't have that motive. So let me ask you, um, sitting here then, um, what things would be important to carefully look at in a case like this? And the state's told you a couple of them. But one thing would be um, talking about the duct tape. You will see the photograph uh, of duct tape that bound Sasha Krause's hands together. As sad as that is. It is a unique duct tape. It is a pattern, a graphic pattern that would be, uh, if it was linked to the accused, would be a significant bridge. So they looked high and low. They looked at every store who tried to sell it. They even may have bought it. They looked at all of his purchase records. He was that heavy. There is absolutely zero connection between Mark Gooch and this graphic duct tape that was used. So that's missing. That's something that's significant that's missing. White car. Didn't hear anything about a white car from the state. But the witnesses are going to describe a white car that doesn't fit into the jigsaw puzzle that they want to tell. The white car is important because it was at the area of the church during the relevant period of time. It was foreign to the community split before the situation the white car. There's no link to, to Mark Gooch. Mark Gooch is a white car. He has nothing to do with a white car. He's driving his Jetta, which was, which was non-problematic at the church area. Those are just examples of things that you would think about that might be important as we determine reasonable doubt. 
But there's another issue that the state brought up, and that is that although there's an overall, as we go through it carefully and show you, an overall lack of forensic evidence, there's the ballistics evidence that was asked about. became aware of it during the selection process. And the state is suggesting to you in its opening that the ballistics is a match. That's what their expert, their training expert says. Well, in this field of ballistics, um, there's supposed to be agreement. There's supposed to, this is supposed to be like fingerprint evidence. And it's clear cut. There shouldn't be dispute. Well, guess what in this case, as you would imagine, there is a dispute. The defense regime an expert, and that expert came to this stuff, and that expert came to the conclusion that the evidence for it cannot be conclusively linked to that gun. Cannot be. So that's important for you to consider, and you'll hear more, and as you determine the credibility of the evidence, you'll have to weigh and consider that. You're going to hear about ballistic evidence and, and manufacturing characteristics and class characteristics and individual and unique characteristics, uh, and you'll come to your own conclusion about that. So those are some of the things that are going to be involved in the case. Uh, and at the end of the day, what you're going to be left with is a, you're going to be presented with a circumstantial case, a case that's lacking in direct connected evidence, and you'll have to decide whether, as we talked about, all the pieces fit together, whether you can ignore a consequential piece that doesn't fit to come to a conclusion. We're asking you not to, to substitute the horror of this case and the emotion of this situation for uh, evidence beyond a reasonable doubt. That's the conclusion that you need to make despite the circumstances that we're in. We're asking you that at the conclusion of the trial, uh, that you find Mark Gooch not guilty because the state has not proven his doubt beyond a reasonable degree. Now, having said that, um, the court told you about a lot of don'ts. She's talking about the admonition and all the things that you can't do. And again, what we're asking you to do is don't fail to absolutely hold the state to its burden of proof. And if you zealously adhere to that, as our founders wanted you to do, you'll find that this case has not been proven beyond a reasonable doubt. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Griffin.